thought, we thought, none of this. Blue Mark. <laughs> He'll speak anywhere, anytime, to an empty house. And he's darn good at it. So we approached him. And before we said a word, he said, I'll do it. <laughs> and so he's going to speak to us today. Let's see. Uh, oh, there's a propeller over here, a wooden propeller. And Lou brought that in. It was the propeller that he took off the plane that he soloed in 67 years ago. I asked him what happened to the rest of the plane. <laughs> I don't know. He's going to tell us right now. Lou Mark, come on up here. I might add, he needs a prop. Now I can start my stopwatch. Hey, uh, today, I'm going to share a few excerpts from my book, My Life in Ladies with Wisconsin, which will include explaining the prop, the good prop that you see here, and also the cover of the book. But before I do, I'd like to say that you people are real gluttons for punishment. That's true. The first time that I was your guest speaker was in June 2005. <laughs> and today is the tenth time. Can you believe that? The tenth time that I was honored with this privilege. How can we forget? <laughs> Bob, you're not sleep yet. Good night, Bob. Anyway, to mark this milestone, Ben Sparker suggested that I acknowledge your endurance with a visual testimony. I accepted his recommendation, and I'll show you what I worked up to mark this tremendous occasion. There's Lou, Lou's bullshit awards. There's one mark for each time I was a guest speaker. <laughs> There's ten of them there, so that makes me a double ass. I mean, double ace. I guess. <laughs> you know, I mentioned in the book that I came from a large family. There are ten kids in my family, seven boys and three girls, and I was number nine. And when, in the 30s, when an airplane would fly over, we'd run outside and say, "Deplane, deplane." They took that and made it, we'll put it in a movie. <laughs> but anyway, the first excerpt I'm going to talk about in my book was my first airplane ride at age 12. In February 1941, my dream of flying became a reality. A young pilot was barnstorming faster than a single-engine ski-equipped Lesko during our winter carnival on the frozen Flambeau River. I spent a cold day just watching him take off and land. During a break from his busy schedule, he shut down the engine, and I walked up to him and said, hey, mister, how much do you charge for an airplane ride? He said, $2. I was 12 years old, I reached in my pocket, pulled out a wrinkled dollar bill, and said, I'd like to buy a half an airplane ride. <laughs> 
he turned to me and he said, I don't give half everything I have kids, sorry. I started to walk away, disappointed at his objection of my offer. And he stopped, he said, hey, wait a minute, kid. Do you know where you can get me a hamburger and a hot cup of coffee? I said, yes, sir, there's a restaurant just a few blocks from here. I can fetch him for you in a few minutes. He said, if you get me a hamburger and a hot cup of coffee, in 10 minutes, I'll take you up for a half airplane ride. He gave me a dollar. So I ran to this restaurant, and I told the waitress, I said, I have an emergency takeout order. A few minutes later, I was back at the airport with the frozen river. He gave me a still warm lunch, and he said, well done, kid. Stand by, and I'll take you up. And I prayed that no one else would. He said, hey, I'll take you up, and I have a lull of full paid passengers. I stood off the side praying that nobody else would come up. A few minutes later, he came in from another flight, and he motioned for me to come to the cockpit. He didn't shut down the engine. As I approached, I felt that the sound of the idling engine was in harmony with my pounding heart. That's true. It was beating in unison with the piston slapping back and forth with the 65 horsepower four-cylinder engine. When I reached the cockpit, the pilot asked for my dollar and said, it's your turn, kid, not yet. The story's not over yet. <laughs> page two. There's only 50 pages left. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, buddy? I've heard about turn pages. When, I, when seated this time, I noted that I was too short to see over the aircraft's nose. However, I was in a real airplane and didn't want to complain. The sound of the roaring engine along with the acceleration of the takeoff and the feeling of becoming airborne created a passion in my 12-year-old mind that I didn't, for flying, that I didn't feel was possible. We made a quick circle of the area and were soon back in the snow-covered river. I was so thrilled that I ran home and coerced my mother into loaning me a dollar from her household budget, which I promised to pay for my next paper routes on the plane. Refinanced, I ran back, this is all true. Refinanced, I ran back to the river and said to the pilot, I would like to buy another half hour airplane ride. <laughs> he responded with a hearty laugh and sent me on another lunch errand. When I returned, he told me to wait off to the side and he would take me off for another half airplane ride. After his last passenger deflated, excuse me, he motioned for me to come to the cockpit. But after taking my dollar, he pulled out two cushions that were standing in the prop last. Put one cushion on the seat, one cushion in the backrest. As I sat on the airplane this time, my feet like, would touch the rudder pedals, I could touch the stick, and I could see over the nose. When airborne, this young pilot told me to put my hand on the stick, put my feet in the rudder pedals, and he guided me through a few turns. Then he said, look at my hands. He had removed his hands and feet from the controls. I was actually flying the airplane. I was so thrilled, and I think he was just as thrilled to see me in such rapture. We circled Lady Smith while admiring the city winter sun, the city lights coming on and landing back in the snow-covered river in the last light of the day. As I shook his hand goodbye, I thanked him for the happiest moment of my young life. I never saw him again, and often wondered what became of him. However, since he was a certified pilot in early 1941, I like to think that he became a famous World War II fighter pilot. He was certainly a hero to me. That was my first airplane ride. For the rest of the time, I'm going to talk a little bit about my book and what I did on summer vacations as in World War II I was in junior high and high school. A little different than some of you guys that are older than me. Most of you are not much younger. But it's the truth of truth then. In December 1941, December 7, 1941, I was 13 years old and a Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Four days later, Hitler declared war on the United States, and we were at war. I was 13 years old. Kids my age 
wanted to participate in the war, but I was too young to join. So we look forward to doing what we could during our summer vacations with different jobs. That's what I'm going to talk about. In 1942, at the summer vacation, I was 14 years old. And I, the older guy that was delivering telegrams, he had joined the Navy. And I went over to the Western Union office, talked to the female philanthropist, and applied for the job. She said, you're a little young, but she has telegrams stacked up. Telegrams in those days were a normal means of communication, but we just come out of the Great Depression, and a lot of people still didn't have telephones. So she looked at the telegrams where she would call in, she would call in, the others had to be delivered. She asked me, do you have a bicycle? I said, yes. She said, are you familiar with the streets of Ladysmith? I said, yes. She says, well, I'll put you on temporary employment. Deliver these telegrams. She gave me a hat with the Western Union logo on the top, a leather pouch that I could put the telegrams in, and she handed me telegrams to deliver. It was a great job for a young kid. I was paid $20 a week and 25 cents for every telegram I delivered, plus the tips. A good tip was about 25 cents. And most of the telegrams were happy grams, I can refer to. People getting promoted, coming home. But after I'd been delivering telegrams for about a week. This is something a little difficult for me to talk about even today. I went in to pick up telegrams, and she said, Louie, she called me Louie because that's my name. <laughs> she said, here's a telegram maybe from the Olsons and the Johnsons. Johnsons. Their son was killed. Whatever this telegram, I don't expect a tip. Can you imagine that? I was 14 years old. I'd get on my bicycle knew the message that I was delivering. I had subliminally pedal kind of slowly delaying delivering the message. When I'd arrive at the house, I'd knock on the door, usually a woman would come, I'd hand the telegram, I'd see it ripped open, hear her slumping, crying, slumping to the floor, calling out the rest of the family that Johnny or Tim or something were killed. Tears would be on my face as a 14 year old. I'd get my bicycle, and ride back home. I delivered several of those during the summer of 42. In the summer of 43, I was 15. By 43, we were coming out of the economic depression that we had experienced during the Great Depression, but labor, there was a tremendous labor shortage. Most of the older guys are in the military, and even the civilians that were eligible for employment a lot of them had moved the cities to work in defense jobs. So there was a tremendous shortage of labor. I saw want for one ad, one ad sign for a clerk in the Coast to Coast store window. I went in and talked to Mr. Royal Brandt, a real nice guy, and said, I'd like to apply for the job. He said, are you 16? That was the minimum age, legal there. I stood on my tiptoes. I was just 15. I said, yes, sir, I'm 16. He said, well, we'll hire you. I added, there was a Georgiana Rock, who was a recent high school graduate who worked as a clerk. There was another one, Charlie Cap, who was a 4F, I don't know why, and me. And I joined the staff in the Coast to Coast store. And I worked there for the summer. A hell of a good job. He, showed, he taught me how to use the old cash register machines. You remember, you'd pump a punch in a letter and you'd crank it. My letter was D. In August, after working in the store, the farmers needed help to bring in their crops. So for about two weeks, I, after working up to about 5, 5.30, the farmer would come by and young people and other adults would get in the truck, back of the truck and go out and help him bring in his crops. We would work maybe until sunset. And I still remember him at the end of the work day having cold beer in a wash tub. Even though we were supposedly 16, I remember him saying, you work like men, I'm gonna treat you like men, and you limit us to two bottles of beer. The same summer of 1943, we had German prisoner of war working in the Stokely Van Camp plant. And I'd take my bicycle and ride down, and my broken German, I'd talk to some of these German prisoners. We're going to get to the problems to stand by. 
1944, I had finished the freshman year in high school, and a bunch of us saw an ad. Vince is checking his time. I've got my time too here, Vince. Or you just, you're trying to say how much time you have before you go to sleep. <laughs> in 1944, we saw an ad in the local paper for seamen to man the freighters in the Great Lakes. We thought that would be a tremendous job, not only for pay, but to help the war effort. So 10 of us, 10, the day after school was out, we went to Superior to apply for a job. We saw the recruiting officer, and he asked, it was kind of surprising, 10 young guys there, he said, I have one question to ask. Are you men? He called us men. He said, are you going back to school in the fall? We couldn't lie. We said, yes, we are. He said, well, I'm sorry, I can't hire you. It takes about a month to train a seaman, and our trip on our saving season goes up in November. He says, it just wouldn't be practical to hire you for working on the ships when you're going to leave the end of July or early August, I mean, early September. He said, he saw the disappointment, he said, but if you men are interested in a summertime job, he said, I'm sure you can get a job with the Sioux Line Railroad. He said, these, these heavy iron ore trains over the winter and the spring, they will misalign the tracks, some of them will sink. They have to go by and, and raise them and realign them every, every summer. So he said, I'll call the guy in the Sioux Line. So he called him. And he, he came back and he said, he wants to see you. So the 10 of us went down there, and on the spot he said, you're hired. He said, you're hired for an extra day. They call them candy dancers. And he said, but I want to tell you what the job is. He said, we realign and level tracks. You work six days a week, 10 hours a day, 60 cents an hour. We provide free food and lodging. We all raised our hand and took the job. He put us on a train and went to northern Minnesota and worked on an extra game. They had a series of passenger cars that they converted into bunk cars, a latrine car, a mess hall, and it was what a hell of a nice job. Hard work. The foreman said, I need one man to team up with a fellow to operate a pneumatic jackhammer for camping. He said, that pays five cents an hour more. I raised my hand. He says, you got the job. He matched me up with a Russian immigrant. Great big guy, about 6'3 or 6'4. Must weigh about 250 pounds. Tattoos on both arms. Spoke very little English. Talked in, in monosyllable <laughs> words. <laughs> but he took a liking to me. He took, me on, he took my back, so to speak. And he would say, I remember him saying, Stalin, bad, Hitler, mean. Martin, I like you. This guy, when we were operating that pneumatic hammer, the first week or so, my muscles were stiff. But as I thought, after about two weeks, I could feel the muscles in my arms and my shoulders growing. And I became really, really strong. We had hit these small towns Saturday night. We didn't work on Sunday. We'd go into a local bar, and his name was Argo, was his name. And Argo liked to get these local farmers, they were pretty husky themselves, for a one dollar arm wrestle. And after about three or four, he'd plot these farmers down, and they'd say, no more. And I can still remember him say, arm wrestle with a kid, pointing to me. Well, they'd look at me, I was 16 years old. They didn't know what the arm strength I had in these farmers. I'd arm wrestle with him, I'd let him go about 30 degrees. You're not you're not that lucky. <laughs> it's still working. <laughs> Bob, you're still awake. <laughs> I'm gonna wake up Bob. <laughs> It's a Swiss cowbell. Are you awake, Bob? I'm awake. <laughs> I'm, wa I'm waiting for the punchline. <laughs> punchline is when you start snoring. 
Oh. <laughs> anyway, I worked, I worked in that extra gang until the middle of July, and then went back to Ladysmith and worked in the Stokely Van Camp in Cannery for the rest of the summer. Now we're getting close to the highlights with Bob looking forward to talking about the prop. That's the only reason you came here today. Sure, that's right. In 1945, the war in Europe was over, as you know. The war in Japan was still raging. The planned invasion of the fall of 1945 and 46. The war may go on for a number of years. We, I was, then I was 17 years old. We knew the defense plans were still operating. So a classmate of mine, Bob Woodard and I, we took a train to Chicago to work in a defense plan. Took a room in the YMCA, and we got the Chicago news, all kinds of want ads for labor. We took a job in a door two in the vending company, which is walking distance from the YMCA. Worked there for a week, it was a hell of a job. I was working in acid, immersing 50 caliber shells in an acid bath, wearing a rubber apron and rubber face mask and gloves. It was a hell of a job. Then I got a job in, in uh, what was it? C.H. Gimbal, two of them died. Learning to operate a, a drill press and a service grinder. Good paying job. But what happened is my sister-in-law, my oldest brother who lived in Detroit, she got a hold of me. She said, my mother was worried about me working in Chicago on my myself as a 17-year-old. And she said, Let's make a date for dinner. She said, I'll take you out to dinner tomorrow night. She took me to a real fancy restaurant, and I didn't have a coat and tie on, but she tipped the maitre d' $20. She said, that's OK, come on in. We sat down, and she said, Louie, she called me Louie because that was my name. She said, would you like a shrimp cocktail? I said, I'd prefer a glass of beer. She said, well, Shrimp cocktail is not a drink. I says, it isn't. <laughs> I said, why do you call it a cocktail? <laughs> anyway, she said, your mother's worried about you. Why don't you come to Detroit and work for your older brother? And I said, well, I'm making good money. Clock's still working, Vince. Be happy to hear. And I said, I'm making good money. She says, but he can find you a job. I knew he, he was a structure pilot. He was 37 years old, a little on the outside of the draft. But he worked as the captain of the CAP. I knew he had an airplane, and she said, well, let's call him. So we called my brother George, and he said, Orly, he called her Orly because that was her name. He said, she suggested that she come to Detroit and work for me. And I said, well, what the hell can I do? He says, well, he had a tremendous photography business door to door, taking photos in houses and during the war, it was really lucrative. And he says, well, I can give you a job and I can give you flying lessons. Oh, wow. He said, it won't cost you anything. And he says, I might even be able to get you to Seoul before you go back to high school. I said, I'm on my way. The next day, Orly, I call her Orly because that was her name. We were on a DC-3, DC American Airlines DC-3 to Detroit. Good to his promise, my brother started giving me five lessons, and after about the second or third lesson, I remember what he said. He says, Louie, he called me Louie because that was my name. He said, that's the last time I'll use it, Vince. <laughs> he said, you know, you take the flying like a duck to water. He said, first I thought I'd get you to Seoul before you went back to school, but if you're willing, he said, we might be able to get you a private pilot's license before you go back to school, but it's going to be hard work. You have to do navigation, you have to work weather, take a written test, take a flight check by a CAV. I said, count me in. So for the next 59 days from my soul to September 1st, I took a private pilot's license check. And I went back to school in the fall. I was disappointed that my high school classmates didn't think my private pilot's license was valid until I got checked out at the local airport. And then I could take the boys up. We could rent an airplane for $6 an hour. So I'd get a couple of them, and they'd get a good, cheap airplane ride. But I'd take the girls up free, of course. <laughs> a little bit of interesting sidebar note. In 1997, 
my 50th high school reunion, this old lady came up next to me. As it turned out, she was a classmate. And then she identified herself as a classmate, so she didn't look so old. And she said, Louie, she called me, well, I can't use it anymore. She says, I got my first airplane ride with you. Do you remember? And I said, yeah, sure, I remember. She says, but I'm going to tell you something I bet you don't know. And I said, what's that? She says, all the mothers in town were telling their daughters, I don't want you to fly with that 17-year-old kid. And I said, yeah, but you gals did. She says, yeah, but we just never told her. <laughs> but fast forward 45 years. I was working for the FAA. I had to go to Detroit on business. If you may recall, that piece, that Boeing 727 and DC-9 ran together. That was 1990. Quite a few people were killed. I was there for the accident investigation. I called my brother, who is now an old, retired, divorced bachelor. He was 47. I was 17. He was 37. I mean, 40, 17. He was. Yeah, I was seven, no, I was 17, he was 37. He's 20 years older, so 17 and 20 is 37, right? Yeah, okay, good. Got it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and so I went to, took a taxi to his townhouse where he walked for dinner. His two car garage, like so typical, very typical, just enough room to fit the car in. I had to walk sideways to get to the passenger side. And I looked over behind some boxes, and here was a prop chip sticking out behind some boxes. And I said, George, what the hell is that prop? What prop going over behind those boxes? And he said, well, he said, sometime a few years after the war, I sold the airplane, and the mechanic said the prop was cracked. So I put a new prop on it, and I just started the rest of my junk. And I said, well, hell, that has to be the prop that I sold with. No, my brother. He said, well, of course. It's the only damn prop I have. And I says, can I have it? He says, I don't care. So he backed his car out. We moved some boxes. I pulled this prop out. This was 40 years after I sold it. And I put it in an airplane. I flew it back to Minneapolis. And it sits on my hero's wall in my townhouse. And so this is the prop that I sold with. It's a serviceable prop. It wasn't cracked. It was just the varnish that was cracked. He sanded it off here, you can see it. This could be used today, but it's my prop. So, what did he say, 67 years, Vince? 67 years ago is the prop that I sold, and I have it. What kind of plane did you sell? Taylor Craft, 65 horsepower Taylor Craft, nice airplane. Oh, we're doing okay on time. How did you feel when you sold it? No, not at all. Just one quick story on the solo. This was a little airport grass strip triangle. And my brother, which is usually, the kid, if you make three takeoffs and landing successfully, when you're at that stage, he said, go ahead and fly. This is way down in the end of the airport. This was in August, no, July, 20, July 21st. He got out, and he said, make a takeoff and landing. I made a take off the landing, taxi over to the FBO, went to the Coke machine, got a cold coat. I completely forgot about my brother away in the end of the airport. <laughs> and he was really pissed off. I was sitting there in the shade drinking a coat, and I saw my brother come and swatting mosquitoes as he says, What the hell are you doing? I says, well, I made her take off and landing like you told me. He says, God damn it, you left me out in the middle of the airport. I had to walk a mile in. He says, get your ass in the airplane and make takeoffs and landings until I signal you in. So I did. I said, yes, sir. So I made takeoffs and landings. Every time I'd come by the FBO, he'd go like this, another one. Funny, it was good, getting night. All this night, he'd wave again. Took me out to a restaurant that night. The next day, we went, to, I mean, the next day I started to fly navigation. But, since it's the Christmas season, and I still have a few minutes before Bob cuts me off. And before I turn it over to the Q&A session. You know how you say, Merry Christmas? 
Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in German. Prohoschi Weihnachten, Glaubwitz Neues Jahr. That means Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in German. And the recent snowstorm reminds me of a humorous event I experienced during the 1950 Christmas season. At the time, I was a happy-go-lucky Air Force Ambassador, second lieutenant, and stationed in Rhine Main Air Base, Germany. I was wearing a new blue uniform and driving a 1941 Greek Chevrolet business school. Like many other ambassador officers, I was invited to a Christmas party in the nurses' housing complex adjacent to the 95th Army Hospital in the suburb of Frankfurt. The area had just experienced a big snowfall, an unusual event for this part of Germany. After I arrived, I had a difficult time in finding a place to park because of the snowbanks along both sides of the road. In addition, the sidewalk leading into the apartment holding the party had about three foot high snowbanks on each side as you walked into the apartment. The apartment was jam-packed with happy holiday revelers, was extremely warm and overloaded with rich snacks and strong alcohol glazed eggnog. I had more than my share of the food and strong drink and became feeling an onslaught of poisonous. Again, this is all true. I figured I needed some fresh air to keep from getting sick. I went outside, took a deep breath, and leaning over, stuck my head inside a snowbank adjacent to the pathway. I was bent over with my head immersed in the snow when an army lieutenant and his date arrived. As he entered the walkway, they observed an Air Force officer with his head stuck in the snowbank and not moving. Concerned, the army lieutenant tapped me on the shoulder to see if I was okay. Startled, I popped my head out of the snow and with my 22-year-old full head of hair, eyebrows, and face were covered with snow. I must have looked like an Air Force snowman in a blue uniform. <laughs> I greeted their startled look with a hearty, Merry Christmas. <laughs> they asked if I was okay. When I replied that I was, they walked on. After they left, I placed my head back in the snowbank and joined the party sometime later after feeling much better. Once back at the party, an army lieutenant, not recognizing me with the snow combed out of my hair and my face washed, started telling me about an Air Force officer he had seen outside with his head stuck in a snowbank, and if I knew who it was. I told him that I didn't know who would do such a stupid thing. <laughs> now, as usual, I've got a short song here I want you to hear. We're just 31 minutes right now, Vince. That's not too bad. Yes. Considering the old guy. <laughs> but this is a song. Oscar, you've heard of Oscar Brand. Bob's still awake, right, Bob? Yep. Good. I don't have to ring the bell again. <laughs> anyway, this is a song from Oscar Brand about a copa. Let's see if I can work this here. Flight plan and study the weather. Pull up the gear, drop it. 
don't, I don't mean to be number 11. Okay? I don't have a few more stories, but you're getting old. I have time, enough time for a couple of Q and A's. This probably has one. Don't you, Vince? You have a question? Roll has a question. Tell us about you and Chief flying in 1995 on a place to fail. What did we fly in, Gene? The Stearman, wasn't it? Well, Stearman, we could protect the next flying. Yeah, we, with this young gal, I took her up in a T6 and a Stearman, and she's still alive. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's still smiling. But I hope you don't pass on to Jesse Ventura that I compared him to the Russian that I teamed up with. He'd get a little pissed off. Any other questions? John. Oh yeah, they cut a patch out of my shirt. No, it's somewhere in Triangle Airport. It was just north of the airport where they built the B-24s and we were told not to fly over, but I can see the B-24s are turning off one every hour. And we were, the Triangle Airport was very close to that. But I want to tell you, this is looking at us watching them, but he said it's okay. Good BS. Good BS, yeah. This is, this is number 10. But I want to tell you one, on the solo, or on the scooter, on the private check ride, then it was the CAP flight examiner. And we had to do spins, had to do Cuban, uh, lazy eight, S turns around the road and so on. My CAB examiner was a big, heavy set gunman boy. And we had to wear parachutes. We took the cushions out of the tinker craft. It's a small cockpit to start with. We took off and I flew for about 40 minutes. And this, it was a hot day, hot. July, August day, and this my CAB examiner was profusely sweating, and he, we were wearing these parachutes crammed with this tailor craft, and he said, God damn it, Martin, he said, it's hotter than hell. He said, if you can land this airplane without killing this, I'll pass you on your check run. <laughs> so we only flew in about 40 minutes, I went back and landed, and he said, and this is the thing, what's it, Liza, Liza Doolittle, and my fair lady, who had given all the credits to Professor Higgins, and she was standing off the side. After I'd worked like hell and got my pilot's license within 59 days, they were congratulating my brother. <laughs> and the CAP examiner and a couple of other instructors were congratulating my brother for getting this kid through <laughs> in 59 days. And I was standing back, nobody was noticing me. But it didn't matter, I had this, I had this certificate. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, Steve. What about the time you were flying off the flambeau in the winter, and there was something about electrical wires? Well, <laughs> that is, it's in the book. Anyway, a few of you have been fortunate enough to buy the book, to read the book. I bought five with me in case anybody has a little extra change. They're only $15 and no charge for my signature. But what Steve was talking about, this I worked in a fast food place for flipping hamburgers. And the guy I worked for, his name was George Hunt. And on a Saturday afternoon when things were slow, he knew I had a pilot's license. This would have been in 46. He said, Louie, he called me Louie because that was my name. He said, let's go out and fly and, and blanch and run the restaurant. It's right after a big snowfall, just like he had the other day. And we called up and Hal Dowdy, who was a P-40 pilot from World War II, he warmed up a rocket champ. And we took off, flew around Ladysmith. Right after this big snowfall, the sights were just beautiful. So to, for a little excitement, we flew up on the Flambeau River, and I started flying about 10 or 15 feet off the river. And it's skis. Skis, that's right. Thanks, Roll. Glad you're still awake. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't sleep very often. <laughs> but anyway, we were on skis, and I was flying down over the Flambeau River, and I unintentionally got down lower than I expected, and I hit the snow, and the snow flew up right after some big snowfall. 
And I thought that was really exciting to see that snow fly by the windows. So I shoved the full throttle, and I was intentionally now touching the snow as we were flying along about 100 miles an hour. I'd hit the snow, the snow would fly up, and we were, and George was sitting in the back laughing like hell. He said, that's fun. And I turned around to enjoy his laughter, just like I enjoyed Chuck's beard, <laughs> which he's going to shave off one of these days. Anyway, I look, I turned around to see George to enjoy his laughter. And as I turned back, here was high tension wire right in front of us. <laughs> right in front of us. I instinctively knew I could not pull up over them. So I shoved the stick forward. We hit the snow very hard underneath those wires. The powder snow flew over the whole airplane. And we just missed the wires, and I pulled up. George never saw him. As I pulled up, George said, that was the best one yet, Louie, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, George, our flight today is over. He said, our hour's not up, which he paid for. And I said, no, today, uh, he doesn't, Blanche doesn't know how close she came back to running in restaurant as a widow. But that's what Steve was talking about. That's, there's a lot of interesting things in my books. Okay, uh, thanks, Vince. Well, the last BS story that he gave us, um, uh, when the place was empty, he was still talking. Well, I came back the following Wednesday, and guess who was here? Still talking. No one does it better. Let's hear it for a little while.